Welcome to Networking Rx, a podcast devoted to helping business professionals like you enhance your networking skills in order to become more proficient giving and receiving quality business referrals and improving the overall quality of your life and the lives of those around you. The Networking Rx podcast is a production of AmSpirit Business Connections, an organization whose mission is to empower business success through networking. Think about this. Are you the same person you were 10 years ago? Of course, I don't know how old anybody is. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, same person when you were in high school? How about when you were a little kid? Are you the same person? I can honestly say in many respects I am, but in many respects I'm not. And um, I, w- I won't get into all the details, but you know, I can think back to, you know, being, uh, uh, you know, being younger, being in school, being more opinionated on things, more closed-minded. Part of it is is that you're just not exposed to the world. I grew up in a little town, Houghton, Michigan, very racially, uh, I wouldn't say segregated, but uh, homogenous. Um, it's you know cold north it's you know it's a lot of uh, white scandinavians um it's just that's just how it was and it's nothing nothing racist about it just how it was um and uh you know so didn't have a lot of exposure to the world then you get out into the world and you have other experiences you're exposed to other people and you sort of your thinking sort of changes i stumbled across an article in the october 2022 edition of psychology today and the article has a number of different authors to it but the genesis or not the genesis but the the gist of the article um, is how you change how we change and i think it's important to really kind of talk about change this is a podcast about relationships personal and professional relationships and if i can acknowledge that i have changed then i need to give other people credit that they've changed so there might have been somebody that I knew back in high school and they just rubbed me the wrong way or somebody that I knew in college and they just we we just they rubbed me the wrong way we just weren't the same person we just didn't see eye to eye Um, and I have to acknowledge that you know what maybe they're not that same person and the reason I think this is important is because if we judge people on little microcosms of their life for example let's say uh, you had a college roommate or some a room uh, someone who lived in the dorm two doors down and you kind of interacted with them but you didn't and they just you know he just didn't they just didn't seem like oh my gosh i'm not going to get along with this person you know that if that if that wasn't you in college in other words you've matured and you've changed then likely they've changed as well. And so you need to keep an open mind with respect to how people might, or or that I guess not how they might have changed, but the fact that they might have changed and that they might have become more mature as time has gone on. Uh, Anyhow, in the article, it kind of takes you through like the formative years. And basically what it says that, uh, I'll quote from the article, quote, you might think of, of temperament this is talking about the formative years you know early you know when we're born we have a certain personality Um, quote you might think of temperament as the biological foundation for personality but personality itself is made up of a child's temperament plus how their experiences shape their temperament throughout life Uh, that this suggests that while personality starts at birth it can change over time end quote interesting probably not surprising you know people you know they've and there's studies out there identical twins who were adopted into different households into different environments and and how they they're they, they don't have identical existences and then we sort of roll into our early childhood and we according to the article we really look to our parents um we we really look to our parents for guidance and This is probably an argument for, uh, you know, strong families. Um, And uh, and I'm not arguing for a two-parent household. I'm not getting political on any of this stuff. But having involved parents is really helpful to children because they're looking for that sort of guidance. And then it kind of changes when you get into puberty. And this is uh, 
this was really interesting because the article starts out, I'll give you a quick quote. Well, it's quote of quotes. Um, can you put your dishes in the sink? Please put your dishes in the sink. I'm not sure you heard me. Can you put those dishes in the sink? And if you're a parent with teens, you've probably experienced this, experienced this and we think we often think that teens are rebellious. Um, and so you might look at somebody, let's say it's a, a, a children of a friend, um, and man, they're rebellious. They don't do what their parents ask. And you might carry that perception of, of them, uh, carry that perception of them forward when they're 25 years old and think, well, I wouldn't hire that person because of who they were. In reality, that's not who they were. They have changed. And I see that I see that a lot with my kids' friends. Um, well, I certainly see it a lot with my kids, but with my kids' friends where I just get little snapshots of them. And that would, they were teens. When they were teens, they were, I don't want to say they were rebellious, and I'll explain what the article talks about. But, you know, they weren't totally cooperative with their parents. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a tainted view of who they, who they were. And what it says in, in here is that, um, new research shows, quote, new research shows that it's not exactly that teens refuse to listen to their parents. Um, it appears adolescents process their parents' voices differently than they did during childhood, uh, end quote. And I'll quote another part of this. Fetus in your utero can recognize their mother's voices before they're born. Um, Yet with adolescents, even though they've spent even more time with this sound source than babies have, their brains are turning away from it in favor of the voices they've never heard. In other words, we've heard we've heard our parents' voices for, you know, 12, 13 years, and we've learned so much, but it's almost like, okay, stop. I'm I want to listen to something else. I want to kind of expand my mind and and learn other things. So Teenagers aren't really being rebellious. They're just searching for other information. Thank you, mom and dad. Thank you for everything you've said, but I need to find other information. Then obviously when we get to be teenagers, there is lots of other information. We're hanging out with groups of people. There's a whole lot more independence. You're changing classes in high school, maybe maybe in junior high as well, or middle school, whatever they call it nowadays. Um, and then you get off to college and you're out on your own and it's just sort of a different kind of a world, your parents are still there. You know, I've, I always worried about my kids. Um, you know, I was brought up a certain way. I want them to be brought up a certain way. Not, it's not that it's the only way. Um, but you know, I wanted them to understand the value of a dollar and hard work and, you know, and being disciplined and those sorts of things. And then they sort of push away and you're kind of concerned about them and they go off and they see all sorts of different things. And I remember having conversations with my kids coming back and and they're seeing interactions with other families and they're, they become more appreciative of what you've done. Wow. You know, I, I can see how other people, um, how other people were raised or how they manifest themselves. And I don't like it. I'm very comfortable with what we have. Uh, but the other thing that it talks about in the article is is that as we mature, we tend to mellow. And I think that's that's very true. Um, and I don't know that it's an energy thing. You kind of lose energy. I just think that you start to get a better perspective on everything that's going on out there. You know, you see certain people and you, you know, you might have heard about certain religions and, and had a had a preconceived notion as to what they are about. Um, But then when you start meeting the people, you realize, okay, they're just people. And again, I grew up in a, I grew up in a, in a, in a small area of the country. There aren't a lot of blacks. There just aren't. Um, There might be kids who are attending Michigan Tech University, uh, but there aren't a, a, a lot of black families living up in that area. And it's not, you know, um, it just isn't. I, I'm not even going to speculate as to why. I mean, and it just, they, they just aren't. Um, and, uh, and so I didn't really have a lot of exposure to black people until I went to college. And a lot of my, I played football, a lot of my teammates, many of my teammates, and then ultimately fraternity brothers were black. And so all of a sudden this, you know, what I had been hearing about that particular 
race, if you will, um, was, I don't want to say wrong, but I just realized these are just people. You know, they like to laugh. They like to run around. They like to drink. They like to do all the same things that the white kids did, right? I mean, there was no difference in, in my mind. Um, and there were some people who, uh, some white kids who annoyed me and some black kids who annoyed me and some who I thought were really great. And it really had nothing to do with the color of your skin. And so those experiences kind of opened my eyes to, you know what, people are really people. And it's not just race and skin color, but it's religion and even uh, socioeconomic status. You know, people who were there were some there were some kids who came from money that were really nice kids and some who were big big assholes um, and this was the same with people who didn't come from money um, he talks in here about marriage and and marriage how marriage changes us and and um, it often says that uh, married couples grow more alike over the years I'm quoting um, and the research has found that they do and, and there's certainly a lot of reasons for that you've there's a there's kind of a shared compromise in in a household, you know you've got to come to terms with how things are going to be done, how are you going to operate, um, not necessarily beliefs. I think there are you know my wife's an Ohio State fan, I'm a Michigan fan, um, and there are the things that we disagree about, but there are a lot of things that we agree about, and then there are a lot of things that we disagree about where it's just kind of like all right, you know what that's not a hill I want to die on, so whatever. You know, go for it. Um, and I really can't think of anything uh, offhand. But they're just little things like that, little bumps in the road. And, there, you know, there's I think anytime you bring two families together and that's really what a marriage is, you know, I'm bringing into the marriage my relationship with my parents and my interaction with my mom and my dad and their interaction with each other. And my wife brought the same. And we need to make that all meld together. And so that certainly changes us or certain, certainly shapes us. Um to whomever, hopefully for the better, in most cases for the better. So the gist is that our is that our personalities change, right? Our personality changes. You can see it in yourself. We need to be able to grant people the benefit of the doubt, the grace that their personality has changed as well. But the article ta- goes on and talks about, well, what the future. Um, it says here, the desire to change for the better is nearly universal. Research finds widespread ambition to become more outgoing, optimistic, or charismatic, and less pessimistic or neurotic. But is personality change actually achievable, or are traits fixed and unaltered? And what goes on to talk about research that was done by Nathan Hudson at Southern Methodist University, SMU. Um, But what they found is, is that people who actively work to change aspects of their personality, in many cases, were successful. So if somebody wants to be more extroverted, they can change that personality. Um, I mean, it's not going to take work. It's not just sitting there and saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm this, I'm this wallflower. I'm going to be extrovert. Uh, but, you know, just like exercise, if they focus some attention, they can make those changes happen. So the, the point to this This podcast, this episode is that you've changed and if you want to change, you can change more with respect to your personality. But we need to give other people the benefit of the doubt. We can't say, well, that person is that way and just write them off as being that way because if you've changed, they can change as well. And that's, you know, it's it's a great reason to never totally pass judgment on somebody, never give up on somebody, try not to hold a grudge. Uh, You know, I get people wrong us and we need to be wary of that. But people want to do the best more often than not. Um, Yeah, there are the bad actors out there. 99% of the people aren't. They want to do better. They want to be more optimistic. They want to be a better person. They want to be viewed as a better person because it just provides a better life for them. And so we need to just be open-minded to that people people are are really good. Um, And you're trying to be better and they're trying to be better as well. Final point from the article. Is it good to be somebody different? Is it good to change? And there's a little bit in here and it, uh, I'll, I'll read from it. It's a, short, it's a short piece. Quote, 
there are real benefits in recognizing that you're not the same person you were in the past and that your future self will also be different, be a different person than you currently are. Research shows that actually perceiving your future self as a different person is helpful for decision making as it enables you to have a greater empathy for your future self to understand what will matter to the, that person and to utilize that perspective to make better decisions today. This liberating outlook also enables us to have empathy towards other people. Rather than overly judging someone based on who they were in the past or even who they are today, we can recognize that they too have the capacity to change. That little bit was uh, from uh, Benjamin Hardy. He was the contributing author on this little section. Um, Great points on personality. You're not the person you were. You're not the person you will be, and neither is anybody else. Do the best with it. Thanks for joining us on the Networking Rx podcast. Please put what you've learned into action today and let us know if you have questions, comments, or ideas for future topics. You can email them to us at podcast at amspirit.com. That's A-M-S-P-I-R-I-T dot com. Finally, so you never miss an episode, be sure to subscribe to the Networking Rx podcast through iTunes, Overcast, or however you receive your podcasts. Now get out and network with someone. The Networking Rx podcast is the copyright production of Amspirit Business Connection. All rights reserved.